Okay, guys. So I think uh, we're going to start. It's uh, time for our first weekly Crypto Wednesday. This is going to be a new exciting journey um, where we're going to invite some really special international guests from all around the world to share insights, latest developments, latest trends in and outside of the of the crypto market. Uh, in today's call, we have besides myself, we have Gordon and Arthur in the call. Uh, maybe uh, before I hand over to uh, to Gordon first to do an intro for everybody that, that doesn't know me. My name is Sander de Bruin. I'm from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, I was born and raised here. I've been involved in the crypto industry already for a couple of years, four or five years. Participated in, in uh, several projects and currently working in Amsterdam at the Financial Heart at Beursplein 5 with Iconic Digital Asset Management together with Arthur. Uh, and I'm very excited to be one of the hosts for this uh, weekly webinar. We are really excited to share insights, developments, and all sorts of things that are happening in and around the crypto industry. And we're really looking forward to the upcoming um, weekly webinars that we have. We have some really exciting guests already pre-planned in our planning for the upcoming weeks. And more news on that a little bit further down this, uh, this webinar. Uh, but first of all, let me go back to the, to the first person in this call that uh, I would like to introduce. This is my friend from LA, but he's now in a different location. Gordon, I would like to invite you to uh, introduce you to our audience. Sure, thanks, Sander, and you know, very happy to see everyone. Uh, this is Gordon Einstein. Um, like Sander mentioned, I'm mostly Los Angeles-based. I'm an attorney who has a practice that is entirely devoted to crypto and blockchain. I actually went back into the practice law after having previously escaped uh, because Bitcoin's magnetic pull or gravitational pull was just too strong, so I couldn't resist it. And speaking about vortexes and all that kind of stuff, I'm in beautiful Sedona, Arizona. Um, so that's the background I'm, I'm, I'm treating you to right now. But I, I'm very happy to be part of this webinar series. I think we can add a lot of value. Um, just, Sandra, you and I bring our networks together to, to, I guess, open up conversations in this space. And, you know, I appreciate it, kind of like putting it together and Arthur and everyone else. And, you know, I, I won't talk everyone's ear off about this. I'll, I'll talk everyone's ear off later. So yeah. go ahead, please. Cool. So f thanks for that, Gordon. So uh, I can already see that the, uh, we have some really exciting also participants in, the, in our call. A few mm -hmm. of them have been already been approached by ourselves to join as one of the guest speakers within the upcoming week. So that is really fascinating to see that they're also joining this call. And thank you for that. Thank you for everybody that's joining the call and everybody that's also watching the review of this because we will stream it online through our uh, social media channels, which is really cool. And uh, first of all, I would also like to ask you, spread the word, you know, invite your friends to be part of this community that we're building to, uh, to share the good news. Uh, now it's time to go to our second uh, uh, speaker for today, which is Arthur. Arthur, can I give you the word and introduce yourself a little bit? Thank you. Well, thank you, Sander, for uh, your brief introduction. Um, hi, my name is Arthur. Uh, I'm also from Amsterdam. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Iconic uh, Digital Asset Management. As Sander mentioned, we are live streaming right from the financial heart in the Netherlands. Um, that's where our office is. Um, so I hope that uh, uh, we will bring you some, uh, some insights about how we view the markets, uh, 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 what we're currently thinking about the markets, and also uh, we're going to review the Fidelity Asset uh, Report. And like uh, Gordon also mentioned, there is a great blog written by Andy Wong that we also are going to review a little bit. So thank you for that, Sander. Sander, take it away. There you are. Yeah. Oh, Sander is muted. <laughs> Sander, that, yeah. that, that's unlike oh. you. you. You should always <laughs> unmute yourself. You, you're, you're, you're the man. I know, but I'm not a, I'm not a techie guy. I'm, I'm all about, you know, investor relations, sales and marketing. So, but I hit the right button. So thanks for your help guys. Okay, so maybe the first topic that we that we can address uh, that we put on our planning today is COVID-19. This is an actual thing, right? This is a, a global uh, um, thing that, that we are dealing with. This is influencing a lot of people, a lot of businesses. And I'm really curious from both of you on your experience on what happens in and around your, your environment, how you see the markets. And maybe Corden, I can I can let you do the the, the, the kickoff sure. on, on this. Sure. I mean, I it, it's I'll get a little bit philosophical. I, I think history has sort of the the normal projected course that things are going to happen, and sometimes a, a black swan uh, 
takes place, which changes the direction of human history. But I say COVID to me is really interesting. It's changing the direction of human history a little bit, but it's mainly really speeding it up. Just like 9-11 seems to sped up human history and COVID seems to sped up human history. It's sped up, unfortunately, uh, we'll, we'll address this maybe a little bit with Andy's blog post. I think it's sped up the decline of the United States, unfortunately. Um, I think it's sped up the decline of the US dollar. I think it's accelerated the virtual nature and globalized nature of relationships. It's interesting. On one hand, it's deeply broken down globalization because obviously we're not flying anywhere right now and we're not meeting in person, but it's also accelerated the acceptance of communication modes like this. I mean, you know, here we are in Zoom. You know, I'm not, I'm not in Amsterdam. You're not here. It's, but it's not, there, there used to be a certain panache or perceived added value to having large in-person conferences, but now everyone just is looking at those as disease vectors. So the, and just like conferences, people kind of had to get their heads away from it being in person to, and understand that virtual can be real. I think that analogy works for crypto, of course. You know, we, we've had, we had this new asset class that is defined by software, it's defined by virtual and people, you know, just like intellectual property, copyright and trademark, people trouble wrapping their heads around the idea that it can have value. Well, we're, COVID is making everyone realize that sometimes you just need the virtual to get what, what things done. And you sometimes you just can't do it with the purely physical. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's unusual times. I mean, obviously there's economic consequences. It's affecting everyone I know, including myself. You know, some of us, there's actually opportunity here also, but there, no, no one is unaffected, mm -hmm. but it's, but like, like, like I kind of let off on, it's sped up history because we we're going towards this anyways, but it's a weird kind of parallel channel of history that I wasn't totally expecting. I mean, there's, you know, the, the idea that I'm walking around Sedona and everyone's wearing a mask was not in my visualized future, even though the globalization and the virtual assets were. So it's, you know, I, I don't know if we're ever going to rejoin the mainstream of history or this is like some course we're now on. So I'd, I'd love to get the other, everyone else's thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think so far no one can tell if this is something temporarily, you know, it's, or is it transferred to a, a new way of, of, of living? Mm -hmm. Of course, there are different influences all around the world. You're in the, in the, in the U.S. where there are, you know, uh, uh, several cities or states where it's more hectic than, than others. But maybe, mm -hmm. Arthur, you can share a little bit on what's happening in Amsterdam and the Netherlands in, in, in Europe on your perception and how Iconic also dealt with what's going on during uh, COVID-19. Yeah, before I jump into that, I, I want to take it on a personal level. Um, not many people know, uh, not a people that had Corona or COVID-19. And I was one of the unlucky people that had Corona. And uh, I got sick uh, in the end of March, beginning of April. And oh, it, it was terrible. Let's put it that way. Um, I'm just 33 years old. I, I'm a healthy guy. That's at least what I know. Um, of course, I, I love to, yeah, I love life. Let's put it that way. Uh, it, it was pretty, pretty severe. Uh, and, and it took me almost 10 weeks to fully recover. Um, and I will spare you the details. Uh, but it's, it's, it's just terrible if you have it. And you feel it right away. It, it, it's something different. It's, it's a completely different feeling than a flu or, or a cold. Or, so you know exactly what you have. Um, so that, that's the, the personal. But I'm fully recovered. Uh, I tested negative. So I'm, I'm immune, I hope. But that's what the doctors say. So I'm, I'm here again. So let's Actually, that's an interesting question. Do you, do you, do you have antibodies? That's something that I don't know because the, the, the doctors here don't test that uh, yet. Uh, they do it anonymously uh, with the, the, the blood donor uh, bank that we have over here. That's where they do the tests. Um, they only do the COVID-19 test and they say, hey, you're negative. So you don't have any uh, COVID virus in you anymore. That's what I say. Well, you know, welcome. You know, I, I was aware of this as it was happening and obviously we were all concerned. And, you know, like you said, you're 33 and, you know, you're a, you, get, you kind of put in there that you love life. So, I, you know, I, I guess you're not a, a monk. No. But the idea that at 33, you know, you're, you're not obese. You're not, you know, visibly unhealthy. The fact that, you know, it took you out for 10 weeks yeah. is something. You know, when, when COVID started, part of my innocent attitude was I just want to get it and get it over with. I figured we're all going to get it. I just want to get it over with. But that's. You know, because I, I kind of had the flu model in my mind. 
but the 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 fact that you know and part of my blase attitude was that you know if it's my time it's my time but the worst thing in the world is extended illness or being incapacitated later and like having to live with it for life and there's people out there who have permanent lung reduction so it's you know i don't, I don't want to make this the COVID show but you know i'm i'm very happy you're well and i think this is serious yes. and it, it's, it's coming we're getting a second wave and I don't know if the U.S. ever left the first wave, but you know now it's breaking out again in China. You know now I was just reading that you know Pakistan, Mexico, and India are being hit. I mean these are fantastically populated areas, and you know Mexico has direct connections to the U.S. with NAFTA. I mean just from an economic perspective, we're, we're going it's going to have impacts. I mean, do Senator, we may want to talk about you know it, it's affecting mm -hmm. supply chains in a way that I think no one foresaw how I was expecting supply chains to get disrupted once U.S. naval power declines a mm -hmm. great deal, but that's coming forward 10 years. It's kind of nuts. Yeah, I, I think we, we haven't seen everything uh, yet that, that is being influenced by, by COVID-19. And uh, on a personal level, I was really curious when, you know, uh, our local governments, our national governments, uh, gave us the restrictions or uh, as they call the, the the lockdown i was like okay what what is going to happen on a personal level but also on a business level mm. uh, i i onboarded with iconic beginning of this year as chief investment officer so one of my responsibilities is to take care of the existing customers mm. uh, but also look out for for new customers uh, that's one we're scaling up the company we're growing internationally we're building new partnerships so when everything is out, you can't fly out anymore and everything changed in communication. You're not working belly to belly anymore. I was like, okay, what's going on? But it's fascinating because this is what, what, I, what I learned from my old man. He said, you know, every threat offers also, and you mentioned before, an opportunity. So you have to be, uh, be um, innovating, you have to be creative, you have to look, mm. look for what are the new ways to still reach, reach out to people because the economy goes on every day, every day. So, and this is what I found fascinating in the, in the last couple of months since we've been in lockdown and now we are in, let's say, soft lockdown, that business goes on, you know? Um, sure. you, you have to look, look for, for new ways, which we did. We, we attracted new clients into our funds, existing um, uh, participants, increased their participation, which is really cool. We are, um, we have- well, let, 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 me, let, let me ask this to you and Arthur. Why don't you guys, uh, Obviously, we should keep it, you know, the people are here to yeah, yeah. have a general pers investment perspective. But why don't you guys briefly describe Iconic just so there's some context and then take a little bit more time to talk about how COVID specifically impacted crypto. And cool. I, I throw this to both of you. Yeah, maybe, maybe Arthur, you can kick off because you're the, the, the founder, CEO of, uh, of Iconic, and then I can add. Well, uh, even before our local government, or not local government, but the government of the Netherlands said uh, that, that we need to so, go so Sorry, but very, very first, describe, sorry, I don't interrupt. Describe the fund, just so for the new viewers and, you know, not, not sure. to extend anything, but just, just, sure. just in brief. Sure, 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 sure. So, Iconic has uh, one fund currently, and that's the Iconic Algorithmic Fund. It's high frequency trading, and we do a lot of trades every day um, in, in peak uh, hours and uh, we can uh, manage 30 to 40,000 trades an hour. Uh, so that's what we do and we make uh, good returns for our clients in that particular fund. Um, okay, so it's an algorithm and it, it's it, yeah. one thing that I love from the fund, which is actually kind of how you guys come my it is the algorithmic basis of it. Yeah. It's not, it's not a bunch of guys guessing. No, no, it's, it's all uh, quantitative made. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's awesome. And I really appreciate it because I can't do any of it. No, yeah, a lot of people can't, but I think we're just humble. <laughs> oh. I, I, I just want to say context. Okay, now without, without making like the iconic show, talk to us about how crypto specifically has been impacted from your like elite vantage point. How has crypto been impacted by COVID? Well, where, where, where's the nexus? Yeah, well, the, the, the funny part is we are in the financial heart of the Netherlands with a lot of uh, traditional traders and they also had crypto uh, uh, portfolios, of course. <laughs> And I think it was the, 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 the half, half March, I think, before everybody got in lung down. And that Monday, particularly, the guys here at the trading floor said, okay, we're going to sell our cryptos right now because we don't know what the economy will be. And we saw a lot of sell pressure in crypto in that, uh, in, I think it was 12 March, uh, if I uh, mentioned correctly. And there was a lot of sell pressure. And that were the traditional guys that were fleeing out of crypto to have cash positions for other 
margin call, for example. Right. So that's what, what we saw, and that's how COVID impacted immediately crypto. But crypto bounced as never before. And if you compare it to traditional markets, crypto is even, yeah, I think a solid, a more solid investment right now. Uh, also in regards to that, that you mentioned and this block and, and the dollar and the possible uh, collapse of an uh, uh, currency. Uh, yeah, like crypto is almost a safe haven. Almost. Yeah, the, almost. <laughs> do, do, do you view crypto as an alternative asset equivalent to gold and kind of taking that place in a portfolio or where, where does this where does it currently slot in and then I'm, I'm i'm allowing for different forms of crypto but maybe you can first address bitcoin and then the sort of the, the bigger picture yeah that's it's, it's it's really really difficult because it's really early still for for bitcoin and 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 digital assets as we call it of course uh to, to give it an uh to compare it next to gold everybody wants that everybody sees that and also that's the phrase that we are using of course um but but currently we're we're always saying if you're interested in crypto uh and digital assets uh, and you have uh, an investment portfolio then you also need to have some exposure to cryptocurrencies and i think that we will talk later about it also regarding the fidelity mm -hmm. asset report and that we not only uh, uh, are saying this but there is also uh, institutional parties that are already doing this. Sure, interesting. So, and your your point was interesting that the the more, the more, not directly related, you know, crypto is swimming in this bigger ecosystem, and the fact that other investors had margin calls or similar in, stressors, inputs, whatever you want to call it, had sort of a lateral effect on the the crypto markets. So there's a even if, it's, even if it's an independent asset class, it's still affected by overall positions of the investors and what they're looking to accomplish. Yeah. Which of course makes sense, but yeah. that, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Sander, maybe, you know, Arthur kind of provided a good bridge to it. Maybe we should dive into the Fidelity yeah. report. Yeah, we, 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 can, we can kick off with, with, with that. We had a conversation, uh, Arthur and myself, at, uh, at the Iconic office here in, in Amsterdam on the Fidelity report, which is some nice figures, some nice numbers on um, uh, the, the market and where the institutionals are. Um, and I know that, that you also got the, the report. Uh, we, I think we post it also online for everybody to, uh, to download. If you don't have it, uh, send us a uh, message in the chat box so we can send you the link. It's a free uh, download copy, but maybe I hand over to Arthur first, maybe to share some, uh, some of the facts from the, from the Fidelity report, Arthur. You mentioned yeah. something about the, the institutional investors. Maybe that's a good angle to start off with first. Exactly. Um, so the survey is uh, was being held uh, uh, among almost 800 uh, uh, participants, um, and it was divided almost 50% from the US, 50% from Europe. And the most mm -hmm. fascinating part that I found from this report is that 36% has crypto exposure. But I miss one thing over there: is how big is that position? Do they only have one Bitcoin, for example, or just one Ethereum? Yeah. That's something that we don't get from this survey. But the good part is they have a position in crypto. The other most fascinating part of it is that 80% of the participants find cryptocurrency appealing to invest in. And why? It isn't correlated to any other asset class as of now. So it's an independent asset class. But that's something that I truly like. Interesting. The, um, you know, I, I looked through it and, you know, Fidelity, of course, has its Fidelity Digital Assets Division, which seems half lab, half investment house, half, now I'm going over a half, but, you know, sort of regulatory sandbox. They're, they're you know, if, if you're in the wild west of crypto, I, I don't know if, if Fidelity comes up in one's perception, but they're, they're pretty big. And, and that's a that's a large investment house that is actively working on custodian issues. So I, I think I think there's a fascinating nexus between Fidelity. You know, once once Fidelity signs off, I think the institutional investment becomes much stronger. And Fidelity seems to be making a real stake for that to be the case under, unlike perhaps some other large traditional investment banks. Yeah. Do you have some, so, you have some experience with them or what, what's, your, what's your sense of the organization? Yeah. 
Yeah, we, uh, I see. I see you laughing. We, I'm gonna, yeah, yeah. I'm trying yeah, to interpret I, that. I think, I, I think my, my Malev says says everything. Yes, that there there is interest. There is interest, and let's take it to there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, and then it, it was. I know. I know. It's the. It was by a pretty high level. Just, just for everyone in the in the chat. You know, at first we were wondering if this was an internal. Just be real blunt. We were wondering if this is some internal document that we just happened to look across. But you know, it, it is publicly available from the Fidelity website. So we'll, we'll put a link to it directly in the show notes. It, it's interesting. The um, yeah. What, what's their what would you say is Fidelity's position on how much crypto a institutional like what percentage of holdings should crypto represent and they use a very broad term you know they don't actually use crypto they use digital assets i mean what, yeah. how do you how do you how do you play that out yeah i'm putting if, you on the if, spot but you know that's why you're here buddy i know i know i know i know so yeah i i also i, I have the report also here and and i i read it and um it, it, it sometimes it's 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 also vaguely described by them. That's also what I, uh, I want to put it to you. Um, so but what I'm seeing and what they're saying um, is that only 26% of them have Bitcoin, for example, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. And okay. they say that 36% have crypto exposure. So for me, it's really interesting. What is, what, what is the Delta? Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what do they do? Are they just have an internal blockchain uh, that they use for experimenting and that they have a crypto in between or how does that work? So that's for me the most interesting part uh, from this one. Yeah, it, it looks like Fidelity hired this, you know, it's on the first or second page. I can pull it up if I had there. It looks like yeah. Fidelity hired this company Green something or other. And Green reached out to, like you mentioned, the 800 market participants and yeah conducted a survey and garnered their position. And I, I, I you know, the, 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 the usual trope or the usual cliche, I guess, in the, in the crypto markets is it only becomes real once the institutions become involved. Exactly. Now, if, if, you're, a, if you're a crypto rebel or crypto anarchist or a Bitcoin fundamentalist, you know, there's different terms for this. The, the ideas of institutions becoming involved can, isn't necessarily attractive. You know, people got involved with, some people got involved uh, with crypto because it's ability to work around the financial system. You know, in fact, you have, you know, Satoshi's white paper um, implying as much. And then in the very first block mind back in 2008, it's something like, you know, Bank of England ba bails out this or that bank. You know, it's funny how, you know, written right in there. So it was clear that this is sort of meant to route around uh, traditional financial methods. And, you know, Andy's blog, sort of talks about the historical ups and downs of reserves currencies and none of them ever seem to last mm -hmm. no. you know or they may last for a lifetime or so but they're they're not intergenerationally secure but from from you know but from my perspective things things evolve over time and even if bitcoin wasn't intended to initially become an investment vehicle or a place that institutions dominating or playing I, I i think i think it can only help if institutional money is going towards these forms of assets it, 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 it's it's a way of there's, there's pros and cons but among the pros are these are not trivial companies or ventures that government regulators are going to just look to kill mm -hmm. you know they're, they're large they're established people depend on them pensions are invested in them um, they have lobbyists, they have connections. Now, there, there's, a, there's the danger that they can form the regulatory environment to fit their specific model to the exclusion of everything else, which of course is not terribly attractive. But, you know, they, they do, you know, if, if, if crypto, crypto can either exist in the shadows, and that's one positive thing sometimes, or it can exist in light, and that can be positive. To the extent we want it to exist in light, and I think we need it to. Um, this needs to happen. Oop. 
And Gordon, I hope you're still there. We lost you for yeah, a second. I'm, I'm, I'm there. I just, uh, I had a webcam issue, so I don't know okay. why. No, we're happy that you're back. And, and let me take uh, advantage of, of a brief moment. We sure. have some people on the on the chat also asking questions if they can join up. The concept of this, of this weekly crypto uh, webinar is that we invite some speakers. And before the event takes place, you can send in all the questions. If you have additional questions during the webinar, you can post them in the, in the, checks, in the chat box. Um, so we keep it as, as effective as, as possible. So we really appreciate your, your questions, but please forward them in the, in the chat box that, that is best. Yeah. And I'm also really curious, so without mentioning names, we have some really key people in the call, some of my personal industry friends. I'm really also excited to looking forward to hearing your feedback, maybe in the chat box, otherwise in the upcoming weeks, when we get you in as a, as a guest on your perception on whatever happens with the institutionals, what's your vision, are they onboarding this year? What, what, what's your gut feel on that? And also, what is COVID? And that was one of the, the questions. Maybe to go back a little bit uh, uh, back to the, to the start of the conversation, one of the questions that was being asked is, what is COVID's influence on uh, the price level in the, in the crypto market? So if you can fly around a little bit back to that, then, then that would be highly appreciated. Uh, so maybe I hand back to, to, to you, Gordon, so we can, we can continue on that. What's COVID's effect on the crypto markets? Is that the yeah, the, uh, concerning price, does it does it you know inflate the market? Does it, does uh, it affect people's well, emotions you know, to buy or sell? Or I, I I I look, I am not nearly as qualified as Arthur and probably many other people on this call to talk about the day to day fluctuations of crypto. I'm approaching more from a philosophical, technical, legal point of view. But you know, I do put my money where my mouth is with crypto and. The, to my mind, Bitcoin itself seems subject to, and obviously I'm being very specific. And when I say Bitcoin, I mean BTC, yeah. you know, not cash or, you know, some other Satoshi's vision. Mm -hmm. the, it seems very subject to a lot of dark unknown forces, such as, whales slowly unwinding their positions you know we, we we had that movement that's very small movement but you know from a very large old wallet our bitcoin address a few weeks ago and it wasn't so much the the, the amount of bitcoin that got moved but the fact that that owner of the wallet exists and has the keys and can put them on the market so you know that that costs a little hiccup now we, you know there there's it's so also tied to tether and what's going on with tether because people Use Tether as sort of a bridge in and out of various uh, currencies. The Bitcoin currently seems to be in this band of just shy of ten thousand on the upside and just just above eight thousand. Of course, I'm talking U.S. dollars because that's my perspective on the downside. And every every time it seems to break high, it seems to stall out. Every time it breaks low, and I get my you know my notices on my phone, it's like oh no, you know Bitcoin down seven percent. You know, the, the, when I look 20 minutes later, it's back up in the 9,000s. So it seems to be in a kind of steady state band right now. Uh, this is a little bit of a preview of Arthur's discussion. You know, there, there's the, the five, four or five factors that make currency a currency. You know, assuming we want Bitcoin to be a currency, you know, it, it has to be a store of value. It means it has to have kind of stability. It has to act as a unit of account. Um, it needs to be a useful medium of exchange. You know, it's ideal when it doesn't have independent commodity value. There, there's all these, there's all these factors that go into it, and and I, I see the ongoing. You know, this is part of the institutional play story. To the to the extent it's an investment asset, it, it's not really a good unit of account because it's fluctuating in value relative to other assets. It's not truly neutral. But then again, the dollar's not truly neutral either. It, it's highly manipulated no. as well at this point. So it, it's it's really rough. The, the, the potential use of Bitcoin, especially once all of them are mined or minted, is that the amount of it is static. Therefore, mm -hmm. even if it's not completely consistent unit of value, it's going to deflate along a predictable path. But you know, between, between now and then, and that's many years away, it's just, it's a ping pong ball. It's very much subject to a lot of other factors going on. Now, if, if you go to second order cryptos, um, you know, sort of Ethereum, uh, Cardano, uh, EOS, like all, all the ones that are more, that are less currencies and more platform oriented, more smart contract oriented, more, more process oriented. They, uh, on one hand, you know, everyone, obviously for a fund, we're looking at this from an investment perspective, but they're, they're, 
it's not subject to the normal sort of stock and flow analysis that was dis discussed in the Bitcoin standard. It, th those platforms are being actively upgraded and updated. So the nature of what's being traded, you know, even though the name is the same, the nature of it is evolving. And also the, the use cases of it are evolving and these things are in active competition with each other. So it's, you know, did, did, does COVID really affect that? I, these, everyone involved in these platforms was already working remotely, mm -hmm. already working kind of anonymously, posting on message boards, posting what they're doing. I, you know, if, if anything, this highlighted the need to not have physical data centers that you have to go to, but just have worldwide working blockchains and machines yeah. that are distributed and resilient. I mean, you know, so, I, so I, I, I those people, go to no, no, nothing really changed. No, not that much, right? They were already in, in that state of mind. Oh, so something changed in that you know, COVID hit the gas pedal on sure. this stuff, and it took the hit. What I was kind of saying earlier, COVID hit the gas pedal and turned the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. It didn't completely do a 180, but it turned it somewhere down some alley I didn't, I don't recognize, but it's kind of parallel to the main street. Mm -hmm. So, but the, you know, the, if you if you look at Bitcoin, it, it is it is this it is the consummation or summation of several prior attempts to create government, to create, to recreate currency that's free of government, to get away from this fiat model. And the only way they accomplished that given what happened to the prior centralized attempts at this was to create a distributed and decentralized system. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. that, that distributed and decentralized system, the need for that has only become more apparent with the breakdown of certain aspects of globalization caused by COVID. But, you know, is there, do, you know, you save. You know, that's all great. But you know, if you know, if you're like Arthur, if you're if you're sick, mm -hmm. and you're lying in your bed, you know, physical assets, virtual assets, you know, you just want to live. So there, there has to be some infrastructure in place worldwide for this stuff to be usable. Um, but so long as civilization doesn't collapse, I, I think it accelerated the route towards crypto and digital. Yeah, I, I'm really curious on on Arthur's uh, thoughts on that. Uh, uh, from first pers perspective from the crypto market itself, but also from your perspective running a, a, a fund in, uh, in, in Europe. Yeah. So maybe you can add on, uh, on what Gordon just addressed. Yeah, um, uh, well, I, I think that the, the investment proposition right now of, of, of cryptocurrencies is, is there. Um, and, and what we see all across right now is yeah. that uh, people are still investing. And uh, I think that's, that's a good uh, thing to see not only in crypto, but also in traditional assets. <laughs> for example, people are asking me, I'm not the expert, do I need to buy Amazon, for example? I truly don't know, but it's, it's, it's fine to see that people are still investing, even in these hard times. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if Corona impacted it that much. Um, and, and, and if we look at it uh, uh, from a uh, market perspective, well, and, and as a trading perspective, as an algorithmic uh, company, Last month, well, during the COVID, it, it was great. A lot of volume in the markets, so, and that's the best for algorithms. But the, the, the months after, and especially last month, it was a pretty dry month. Not too much trading, stable prices, and, and yeah. Yeah, well, last weekend, Bitcoin dropped a little bit without really uh, big volume behind it. And now it's up again a little bit. So markets are a little bit boring nowadays. And I don't know if it's, COVID related. I think that we need to see, uh, like we have just talked about, if, if there's coming a second wave, yes or no. And like we see now in China, that there's uh, in Beijing, there's a, almost a complete lockdown uh, again. Uh, and how it's going to be, how the world uh, economy will be impacted by that and how crypto will be impacted by that. And that's really difficult to, to predict and, and how people will react uh, to those uh, events that are, I think, are going to happen. Because if Pakistan, Mexico, and China, then it's just a matter of time, I think, that uh, here in Europe, we will also see maybe some new uh, cases of uh, uh, corona. And we just got our freedom a little bit back from our government. Mm -hmm. uh, we can go to pubs uh, again, and uh, we can uh, 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 do little gatherings again. Uh, for example, here at the office, we can, uh, since last Monday, we can have visitors again. I'm truly... Uh, I want to know what's going to happen when a second wave hits and how the economy and the people will react to that. Because yeah. what I'm seeing is a lot of positivity right now and people are still positive. A lot of people still have their jobs. 
also, although a lot of people also lost their jobs, but here in the Netherlands, it's, uh, there was a good social, uh, I don't know how the word is in English, maybe uh, Sander can, uh, can help him with that. Um, yeah, it's like a so social security system yes. to, to help people during these hect uh, hectic yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. We, we, don't, we don't have that in the United States, so rub no. it in. Yeah, so, oh. so everybody still had money, everybody could still pay their bills, and, and everybody's still doing what they usually were doing. Although it's lesser than you could earn if you work, of course, but you can, yeah, you you can have your your, your normal expenses. You can cover them with the, the the social security that you get from the Dutch government. So here, I feel a lot of positive uh, energy, and I hope that positive energy will still be around in the upcoming months and and years. Um, and I hope that it will be uh, also being seen in in the economy, of course. Yeah. I think this will be a nice subject also for, let's say, the next three to four weeks. Uh, again, for everybody listening or watching the review, uh, this is going to be a weekly program and we have got some really exciting guests for the upcoming weeks, not only from Europe or US, but from different continents. We have already a couple of, uh, of our personal friends in today's live webinar from Asia, well, from different continents on the, on the world. So we're really curious on their perception on what's going on in their country or the, the region in the, in the world they are. Maybe this is a nice bridge also to talk a little bit because we also have Andy Wong during uh, this webinar as, as one of the, the, the people listening along. And he wrote a nice article. I think uh, our admin Luke posted already in the, in the chat box so you can download it, uh, it for free. It's on the iconic uh, page. Um, it has to do about the history of 500 years uh, uh, um, uh, in today's, today's market. But yeah. I uh, just see that the admin, look, thank you, Luke, for reposting that, so you can ch check it out. Um, Gordon, you had a few on on this uh, on this blog post, which we do on a frequent base mm. for our, our community. W what's your thought of, after this, after you, you wrote it? Well, we have Andy also listening in this call. So I, I have to be nice, right? No, it, it, it's 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 very interesting. Uh, one of my one of my favorite books from, gosh, I guess the nineties. It was called The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, and it was by a famous historian named uh, Paul Kennedy. And he covered, he covered the modern era, which is generally you know, deemed to be from 1500 forward. And he, he sketched out in that book, and it was very prescient uh, at the time. I, I, again, this is late 80s, early 90s. I mean, this, this, I read this in college, so it has to have been like, you know, 89, 90, 80, sorry, 89, 90, or 91. He's very pressed. You know, he, he talked about how each empire cycles up the qualities that make it cycle up, the qualities that kind of make it stagnate at a certain point or re reach its sort of apogee, how it, it trails for a while and how it inevitably falls and how the falls aren't necessarily pretty mm -hmm. and how the up and comer entity or empire comes over. So you, you can kind of look at it like as a series of sine waves that overlap each other. And you, and I thought Andy's article or blog post did a good, a good short summation of that process for the past 500 years and then correlated that rise of empire to the rise of that empire's national currency. Now, of course, it's, it's interesting because a lot of those empires are, did, did not have fiat per se. They weren't paper money based. They were, you know, you, you had Spanish, you know, guilders or reals rather. You know, yeah. Dutch guilders, and it was this Dutch guilders. <laughs> I, I know, I, I corrected myself. I caught myself. Yeah, you know, at least I didn't say. At least I didn't say we had Spanish euros. That would have been really bad. <laughs> the, you know, the, the supposedly these were you know hard asset base, and you know his article started off with the Portuguese Empire and how it segued to the Spanish Empire. The, the, those mercantile systems and their monetary systems were largely based on the precious metals that they recovered mm -hmm. uh, from the new world, from their mines. So they, 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 had, they, they, they had a kind of an implicit hard basis to their currencies. But then, of course, as he describes in the article, the, 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 the ceaseless wars, one inevitable consequence of war is debasement of the currency. Because you know, especially in the absence of a banking system, that's robust um, and international. And you can kind of get into all the Rothschild stuff if you want to. In the absence of a banking system, your 
the, the sovereign has to borrow and or debase the currency one way or another to pay for these expensive wars. And when it, whenever an empire rises, it feels all powerful and feels all strong. And so it, it, it's, it assumes positions internationally in its moment of strength that is a burden for it to carry going forward. And that if it, if it knew what was going to happen to it, it probably wouldn't have taken on those burdens. So you, one of the ideas of this Paul Kennedy book is that every, it's called imperial overstretch or imperial overreach. And I like how Andy sort of got into that. Like every, every country does engages when it's on top on imperial overstretch. So he, he, he traced a good line or lineage. I think it was from Portugal to Spain, to the Netherlands, to England, uh, to the United States. Uh, what, what he left off there was at the end and maybe that was intentional with, you know, what's gonna happen with China uh, in, in the future. I thought his point about the, the English-Dutch wars, the four naval wars was interesting. I actually didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And I was unaware of the English Navigation Act. It, it, it's interesting how, 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 how economic power falls from naval power. I mean, one point he made was that England passed the Navigation Act, which excluded Dutch traders from the lucrative spice trade in the Netherlands. And then this prompted a series of English Netherland wars. Now, in my mind, I always had England and the Netherlands as sort of perennial allies, starting when, when the Netherlands freed itself from Spanish domination. Not always, no. Not always, you know, you, no. know, if, you know, just like now, like England and France are like such good buddies, but it wasn't quite always that way, or no. Germany and France were such good buddies, but it wasn't, you know, rumor has it they had a little fight last, you know, last century. So it's, it's a good tracing. Uh, I, I guess to kind of sum up my, my thoughts on the article, what, what was neat is he, he also highlighted that when the U.S. rose, um, prior, prior reserve currencies, such as they were, were sort of the, the side effects of the dominant military country, the dominant economic country, the dominant, um, you know, currency printing country. And of course, that was true with the U.S. after World War II, because we had an unscathed economy and we had the atomic bomb and everything else. But he talked about the institutional underpinnings of the U.S. dollar, uh, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Um, so it's... It, the, the U.S. did something a little bit smarter, maybe, maybe because finally the, the technological tools were available as well, in that it created these structures to support the use the use of the currencies, mm -hmm. and to impose or require certain exchange rates. But, but again, as that article points out, in '71, uh, our good buddy President Nixon took us off the exchange rate, and ever since then we've been on this fiat floating excitement, which I think ultimately led to crypto. Mm -hmm. So. It's a good article. It's brief. It's to the point. I enjoyed reading it. Yeah, f thanks. And uh, one of the nice things is that uh, in our country, our small country, Netherlands, we are, let's say, going to soft lockdown. So we are happy to uh, be able to invite also people to come and check us out at, uh, at as we call the financial heart of the Netherlands, Beursplein 5. And Andy is one of our, our partners where we work really closely and we, we are really grateful for him writing such a, you know, a, a brief to the, to the point uh, a blog post. So whenever we can do the traveling, Gordon, again, as you know, you're, you're one of the first people to come over have to, at uh, our head office and meet the team. I can also introduce you. We can also introduce you to Andy. He's a nice guy. He's an expert in his, uh, in his, in his field. Uh, and that's, that's yeah. I, I, I don't know if people actually know, but you're, you're, I believe you're at the, the Netherlands Stock Exchange, the historical stock exchange. Is, is that correct? The world's oldest, uh, Gordon. So it's a really cool place. And, and it, this invite is not only for you. So for everybody that's listening, you know, whenever you're around or you can make a stop over because we're 10 minutes just from the Schiphol Amsterdam airport, it's really close by. We can pick you up. We can, we can show you around the, 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 the scenes. You know, it's a really cool place. There's a lot of history around it. This is where all the trades from ages and ages ago started. And this was one of the things when, when I hooked up with, with Arthur beginning of this year, when he showed me around, when, we had conversation. I asked him about, you know, what's the story about where, why are you located here? And, and because I know it's a tough uh, a challenge to be onboarded with a tough DD to get your, your company here, you know, at this special uh, location. Again, we also always call it the financial heart of the Netherlands because most of the business is being done here. Everybody mm -hmm. knows it's a famous, not only in Netherlands, but throughout Europe. So um, that was one of the things what I thought, well, this is really cool if you're, if you're located with your business here. And I can see it already with in the just a few months that I'm on board here. A lot of our uh, clients, you know, uh, future clients, when they hear that we are located here, it boosts up their confidence, you know, the credibility of the company. So 
the, the point I'm making, not only the, the invitation is towards you, but everybody listening to, uh, to what's here, we've, we've got some, some industry friends. Again, without mentioning names, some of those people that are joining this call now, uh, you're invited. Uh, some of you already replied, you know, happy to do it as a, as a guest speaker. We will do that in the upcoming week. So let me confirm those dates. But before we do that, and then we go to the closing of this webinar, I want to go back to Arthur uh, on, Andy's, uh, on Andy's blog post. I'm curious on two things. So one is, what's your view, what's your gut view, what's your, your um, response on, on the blog post? Because we, we heard from Gordon, you know, do you have this, the, the same view? And secondly, uh, what has been the response from, from the iconic uh, community when uh, we put the blog post from, from Andy out in, in, into the world? Maybe you can share some, some details on that. So yeah, uh, Gordon, uh, I, I want to refer to uh, for first to the dollar. Um, the, the Dutch had the world currency back from 1600 till 1700. Mm. It, it, this is perfect. That's why we have the social security. So it's all good for the US in the upcoming years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure it is. <laughs> so no, but I, I'm completely behind what, what Gordon says. But the most interesting part is where are we heading right now? So we are at the end, that's what Andy describing with the dollar. We don't know if it's taking one year, 10 years, 20 years, that's something that we don't know, but what after that? And we have discussed it internally and also with the Iconic team. And you referred to that already a little bit, Gordon, but we think that it could be that China is the next leading uh, world currency um, because there is a lot of economic activity there. There's a lot of people also over there. So for us, it's, uh, yeah, we think that the, the, I don't know if it's the current currency of China, or if there, there will be a new currency that China will launch. We don't know yet, but we think that China, that the Chinese currency will be the next world currency. I don't know if you are sharing that with me or something that, that I find more interesting. Where, where are we heading? What do you think? I, I, I'd love to comment on that. May, may I? Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So the... Clearly, okay, you know, well, I shouldn't say clearly with COVID anymore. The, the, the general trend of history is for China to become the, do, the dominant economic power on the planet. First equal to the U.S., and that's very soon, if not now. But sh in short order after that, 10, 15 years, and, you know, again, history is in play right now, maybe two or three times the size of the United States. If you look at sort of pre-COVID math, that, that's where it was heading. And if you follow the normal trend lines, the, again, history's accelerated, but China was expected to match the US, not just locally, but globally, militarily by 2045 or 2050. And it's very unlikely that the largest economy and largest military on the planet won't at least be, if there's multiple reserve currencies, it, it's very unlikely it, it won't be at least the first amongst equals or even more than first. The, you know, but China's got some historical issues here. Uh, China d does not have the alliance network that the US has and the West has in general. It, it doesn't have the rule setting capacity that the US and these international institutions have. It doesn't have what I would call base sprawl over the planet. So there, there's, you know, not, I'm, but you know, I'm kind of going to historical markers. It, it, it is getting network control or dominance over the planet with Huawei and the rest of them. So, you know, maybe it's not bases anymore. Maybe it's routers that determine the future of the reserve currency. It, it, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I, I think that look, the, the, the one, the, the Chinese currency is a fiat currency, just like the U.S. currency. And I, I think people don't necessarily want to trade one flaw for another flaw because eventually China's going to hit the same issue as the U.S. with, with, its, with an aging economy and up-and-comers like India, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria. I mean, no, no, one, no one wants to trade one imperial master for another. Now, so th there's no doubt that the U.S. is on a general decline with the dollar. And I, I say a major tipping point would be either be a war in the South China Sea and or uh, the Middle East switching to denominating oil sales in yuan as opposed to dollars. I say those are the two major geopolitical shocks that can kind of accelerate this. But what's interesting about China, and they've been much more aggressive than the, in this than the U.S. And I, and as you know, 
going back to Paul Kennedy's book, the, the upstart power can afford to innovate. The, the status quo power, by definition, can't. So the upstart power always has, a, ha, always has an advantage uh, when it comes to displacing the existing power. So one thing China's been doing is they've been experimenting with this idea of a digital central currency, you know, sort, sort of a crypto one. Um, and if China can create a digital version of its currency, such that the ledger is truly trustworthy and the emission rate or the creation of new one is algorithmically managed and not indirectly managed by the Politburo. Cause you know, who are these guys? I didn't like them. I don't want, I, you know, I don't, who knows what the, their policy is going to be in 10 years. No one knows, you know, no one knows the U S policy is going to be in 10 years, but if China can kind of cross the bridge to making an algorithm, you know, like Bitcoin, making something that algorithmically issues currency, and has a ledger that is transparent and trustable. And they, they just happen to be the one that innovates with it. Even if they don't have the same degree of control over that the US has over the dollar, the mere fact that it's a better model is gonna suck the air out of the room for the US dollar. And I don't think, you know, China's very clever. They don't necessarily go for the win. They kind of go for the neutralization. Like they, they don't necessarily need to beat the US. They just need to make the US not special. And once they make the US not special, China's much greater size has the impact that it's just naturally going to have. So there's also, I guess, let me throw this out there. China's also been become very good with digital and mobile payments, you know, with Alipay and everything else. It is unusual in Chinese cities to pay with cash. In fact, many yeah. places don't accept cash. And especially with COVID, talk about acceleration, you don't want to handle physical cash anymore. Meanwhile, U.S., you know, cash, cash is king. The, to the extent that the digital yuan or the, the other country equivalents of the yuan are being used by Alipay and Chinese backed networks. And the US is kind of hesitant about this and we're stuck in a little Venmo PayPal world. That's also accelerating Chinese control and dominance of the financial Swiss system. So I, I'm gonna pause for a second. Arthur, I'd love to get your thoughts on these, on these points. Yeah, I think that the best thing, yeah, I think the best thing that you mentioned is, is the, the, the petrodollar. If the, 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 the oil is uh, being uh, uh, sold, not in, in dollars anymore, but in, in the renminbi, for example. And mm -hmm. I think Iran is all already doing that because of the sanctions. Because they have to. <laughs> yeah, because they have to. And, and yeah, the Chinese aren't picky, let's uh, put it that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I think that that will be the accelerator at first, even before the military power and stuff like that. I think if, if the world changes from... Uh, an, an oil future with a dollar in between that it goes to an oil future with the Chinese one or the renminbi, mm -hmm. then the Chinese will get that power to become the world's reserve currency. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and the U S actually does withdraw from the middle East and especially from Saudi Arabia and China becomes Saudi's guarantee security guarantor and uses their Iranian relationship to sort of, cool down that current warm war, then, you know, the, the original deal that, the, so right after World War II, um, President Roosevelt, I think, met with King Ibn bin Saud of Saudi Arabia. This is right in 1945, it's on some boat, and I forget the name of it. And they, they made a deal that is still in place, which is the U.S. would provide security for Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia would price oil in U.S. dollars. Oh. And that, that's been the de facto agreement all this time. But, you know, here, we're kind of, you know, Trump, Trump loves Saudi Arabia, but, uh, you know, the U.S. is oil is energy independent now because they have shale. You know, um, I, th I think things are changing. And, you know, if, if, and Ch Saudi doesn't trust Russia, nor, nor can Russia provide security. I mean, really, China is going to be the country that does it. And they're gonna, there's going to be some grand bargain sometime. I don't know when. Um, it, 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 it was. You get paid if you if you got the oil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, get, you, get, you, get, uh, you know, I, one of the things that makes me extremely nervous about COVID, like m most of this, I was just like, okay, it's just, it's a shock, but it's not that that bad. Uh, one of the things that got me extremely nervous is when the commander of a U.S. Air Force, um, not Air Force, aircraft carrier, um, broke rank to report that his people, his sailors were getting sick and needed help. And this caused a big scandal. Well, the, the entire basis of US geopolitical power is our aircraft carriers. 
exactly. It, 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 that, that is, that, those are our mobile bases. That's what keeps the oil going. That's what keeps the, that's, you know, go, globalization was built on the back of the U.S. aircraft carriers and our aircraft carrier groups. Um, and if they, if pestilence takes down the key pillar of U.S. power, you know, it, it is creating an opening in the South China Sea. Uh, I, you know, I saw this back in March. It, you know, you're, you're seeing China stepping up its activity with Hong Kong the, and potentially with Taiwan. If the U.S., if, if, the, if the China exerts control down to the Straits of Malacca, you know, through Indonesia, where most of the oil goes through, um, the oil providers are going to have to cut a deal, include, you know, and oil consumers, including Japan, are going to have to cut a deal. So that may be a history accelerator. We may see something in 2021 20, and 22 that we wouldn't have otherwise seen until 2030 or 2035. So, and and I this by the way this is the best part of Sedona. Hi, <laughs> hi world. <laughs> it's like my lovely wife back from Thailand, giving me matcha to keep me healthy. Gordon, this this is the 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 cream on the on the, on the cake, right? We we've got the best businesses and jobs and so forth in in, in the world, right? This is digital yes. assets. This is the crypto world. We 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 live the laptop lifestyle, and to make a long story short, because we are heading towards the sixty minutes range and. One of the goals for, for this weekly Crypto Wednesday is to have a call. It's going to be fixed in 60 minutes. So we're going to wrap this one up. And before we do, uh, I'm going to ask both of you for a final comment before we wrap up and communicate a little bit on what's going on in the, in the upcoming weeks. I want to first go to Arthur. Maybe Arthur, is there anything that you would like to share as a final note during this uh, weekly Crypto Wednesday call? Yeah, I, I hope that you all uh, enjoyed this, uh, this one. Um... Like we said, we will do this uh, more often. So every week, the upcoming weeks. But maybe the last week I won't be around because I'm expecting a little baby. So uh -huh. uh, yeah, so maybe I won't join the, the last two or three sessions of this one. So, uh, but what I want to say to everybody, uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy. I think that's the most important part because like I said in the beginning, I'm just 33, I'm healthy, and you can get really, really sick. So please be careful. Thank you, Arta. And we're, we're grateful to have you back in the, in the team and that you're healthy again. Health is wealth, as we all know. So thank you for that. Maybe, Gordon, a final note from your side, please. I, I disagree with all that. I'm happy to be part of this group. It's a good conversation. I look forward to doing more. And, you know, Sander, take it away. Cool, cool, cool. So it's, it's really... Um, uh, cool to uh, to launch this initiative uh, with, with all of you. I'm really grateful to have my friends like you, Arta and Gordon, in, in the call and uh, also other friends uh, during today's live, live stream. Also for everybody that's watching the recording, uh, thank you for that. Next week, same time, same place, same link, we'll be here. We've got an exciting uh, new guest speaker coming up for next week and we are already pre-planning for the weeks, uh, weeks ahead. So look forward to, on that. And as a final, I'd say we have a breakthrough speaker for the next one, but I can't can't quite say his name no, no, yet. No, no, no. So we're going to the group. Uh, we, we spoke about it, but don't mention it yet. And it's not. Maybe it is. It but is. this is going to be really, really huge. And I'm looking forward. Once you said this guy is going to be on, on the call, I was like, really? This is exciting. In just one week, we, we're here uh, again for Crypto Wednesday webinar. We look forward to seeing you. And as a personal favor, I would like to ask you to spread the words, invite your community friends to join our call, participate in our in our in our blogs, send in your questions. If you have any additional feedback for for our weekly webinars, we look forward uh, to receiving that. You can send us email to info at iconic.org, or you can contact us directly. No worries on that. On behalf of Arthur, Gordon, and our team. I thank you for being in this call and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week. See you next Wednesday. Bye, thank you, Sander. Thank you, Gordon.